Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now then, a request for UKIP's group in the European Parliament to return over half a million pounds of funding looks like being confirmed tomorrow. The Alliance for Direct Democracy in Europe, the ADDE, which includes UKIP's 15 MEPs, has been accused of misusing European funds for national campaigns on polling for UKIP in the 2015 general election and in the Brexit referendum this year. Well, Suzanne Evans is seeking to be the next leader of UKIP. She joins me now from central London. Very good morning to you, Suzanne Evans. I, I, I know UKIP as uh, saying you haven't done anything wrong here, but if you're asked to repay the money, will you comply? Well, obviously, um, you know, UKIP always says it's not like the other political parties, we're different, and so we need to be seen to be different as well. As you said, UKIP is denying these allegations at the moment. Um, I'm not a member of the European Parliament, so I have no connection with the ADDE, so I, I don't know what, what exactly has happened or not. It's not something on my, on my remit, as it were. But if I become leader uh, in a few days' time, then absolutely I want a full investigation into this. And I will say this too, I think that if there is shown to be wrongdoing, it should not be the party that repays that money. It should be those people who were involved in that wrongdoing or who gave authorization to such payments. Um, our members expect us to operate at the top of the party fairly, equally and ethically. And if it's been shown that certain people haven't, I'll be very disturbed about that. But you get the irony of the, uh, the overall broader point vis-a-vis -vis UKIP and the uh, EU Parliament over the years. I mean, you've spent so long traducing it for overspending, for being wasteful with UK taxpayers' money. And, uh, you know, even if this money's been used legitimately, UKIP has found ways of getting almost as much money as it can out of the EU in various ways. Well, you've got two separate issues there. Yes, the, the way the EU spends taxpayers' money is absolutely profligate. It's totally wrong, and UKIP has quite rightly called that out on numerous occasions. Um, but as far as actually spending money that we've been given by the European Union legitimately is concerned, I absolutely stand by that 100%. The British people have elected UKIP MEPs there to go and do a job of work in the European Parliament. They know they're not sending them there to actually support the European Union, uh, but they're sending us there to challenge it. Uh, and so that the money we get back, which of course is not EU money, it's British taxpayers' money and taxpayers' money uh, for, for other uh, taxpayers around the European Union, it's perfectly legitimate that we should have that money and use it. Now to the leadership. Now it's uh, said, uh, to put it, I suppose, delicately, uh, Nigel Farage is not a fan of Suzanne Evans, therefore you haven't got a chance of winning the leadership. Well, I've always said I'm a great fan of, of Nigel, and I was quite delighted to see him quoted in the papers this morning as saying that uh, if the, uh, um, the, the problems that we've had in South, South, South Thanet with the Conservative Party allegedly spending far more money than it should have done to fight that campaign, that he'd like to, uh, uh, if it comes up for a by-election, he'd like to stand as an MP there again, and I'd be 100% behind that. I'd be delighted to see him fight that seat again. Uh, why not? So, uh, as I say, I, I don't really know what Nigel thinks of me. We haven't spoken for a while, but but I'm 100% behind him, and I hope he will continue to have a fulsome role in the party going forward, whoever wins this leadership election. Well, fulsome role in the party, he dominated, doesn't it? Even if he left the party, in terms of the public, UKIP is synonymous with Nigel Farage, whoever wins the leadership. I think that's certainly been true, and, and, and absolutely, Nigel was one of the founding members, so we're talking about 25 years ago now. But what I've sensed from the hustings as, uh, as we've been travelling around the country doing the hustings in front of members is there is a real appetite for change now. I think we recognise that it is time to move on. Uh, people are feeling very optimistic and positive about the future under a new leader, and that's been very heartening, uh, both for me and I know the other candidates as well. Yes, Nigel is a huge figure. He will have a role to play going forward, but nobody he can go on forever uh, and I'm sure Nigel doesn't want to cling on to any uh, any position you know he needs to to change his focus as well he's obviously doing a lot in the United States now with a president-elect Trump uh, he's thinking about possibly a seat in the House of Lords as well so I, I get the sense that perhaps Nigel wants to move on too and certainly our members are very optimistic about the future under a new leader which will inevitably take the party in a slightly different direction or will have a slightly different change of tone right. and therefore a great opportunity to appeal to a whole new set of 
voters out there. Just want to raise a couple of points um, that you mentioned there. Um, the love in with Donald Trump between Nigel Farage and other members of UKIP. You've been highly critical. We, you and I have talked about it. Some of the comments that Donald Trump made on the campaign trail. Do you think they're getting too cosy? <laughs> well, I think actually it's quite good that, that Nigel was out there building bridges because, um, you know, Theresa May had said some things about Donald Trump that weren't exactly pleasant either. There was even a vote here or certainly a debate in Parliament uh, about whether or not he should be banned from the country. So I was actually pleased to see a British politician out there building those bridges, mending some fences, actually saying, you know, Britain's great. Uh, and I'm very pleased to hear that I think uh, Donald Trump is, is going to be meeting the Queen fairly shortly too. You know, love him or loathe him, the fact is he was democratically elected to be the next president of the United States of America but and I've as been say, as appalled as, as anybody else as despite a, my yeah. reservations about the riots and the attacks okay. that have been made on the but democratic you, process but I just want to raise Suzanne I mean you, you must remember you were appalled by um, some of the comments he made and he was you know taped saying it that he made about women yet Nigel Farage says you know he endorsed the fact it was locker room talk he called him a silverback gorilla well, I, I, I don't agree with, 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 with Nigel's comments, you know, and that's a great thing, you know, about politics. You're, you're allowed to disagree. Um, yeah, I think, I think President Trump said some reprehensible things, but then again, so did Hillary Clinton, and I made it very clear throughout the course of the presidential campaign that I would have found it very, very difficult to know which of them to vote for. People have said to me, oh, but, but Hillary was a woman. Shouldn't you have backed her? Well, no, absolutely not, not for that reason alone. Um, they say, well, Hillary had experience of politics. Donald Trump didn't. And I say, well, that's the point, isn't it? Hillary had experience. Uh, she was found wanting on the basis of that experience. It was that, actually, that I think that, that meant she lost. Uh, I, I think a better woman would have easily beaten Trump. Uh, and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a better Republican uh, would, 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 would have lost to the Democrats had there been a different candidate. And do you think the government should use uh, Nigel Farage's links with Donald Trump, maybe put him in the, the House of Lords to do that? I think... Any government has got to put uh, the best interests of its people first. So that means our government needs to put the best interests of Britain first. Uh, I think Brexit is a great precursor to that. We could have a super trade deal with the United States of America, a bilateral trade deal. Uh, Trump's already ruled out TTIP, this ridiculous uh, European Union construct, which uh, I'm very grateful that seems to now be well and truly hit the buffers. Um, so I think we have a very positive relationship ahead with, with, uh, with America, uh, regardless who's, who's president. You know, we we have the, got that special relationship. It's going to take uh, some serious uh, malfunction to be able to destroy that. And I think the one good thing about Trump's presidency is that he has made it clear he wants to keep that, particularly in terms of trade. Uh, and yes, you know, Nigel Farage may well be able to support and facilitate that, as I'm sure will many, many others of us. Suzanne Evans, thank you very much indeed for your time. Now, our voting closes next week in the UKIP leadership contest, the second UKIP leadership contest, that is, this year, after the party's first female leader, Diane James, stood down from the role after just 18 days. Since then, the party's lurched from farce to fiasco. Here's our Adam. It's a world gripped by uncertainty, split into factions. Welcome to Planet UKIP 2. Yes, two, because they're having their second leadership contest this year. Bournemouth, September. Watch as the alpha male, the UKIP leader Nigel Farage, hands power to the new alpha female, Diane James. But her heart isn't in it. 18 days later, she's gone. The European Parliament in Strasbourg, October. Another leading light and possible future leader, the MEP Stephen Wolfe, has been laid low after an alleged tussle with a colleague during a meeting. A few days later, he's out of hospital and out of the party. I will be withdrawing uh, my application to become leader of UKIP. I am actually withdrawing myself from UKIP. I'm You're resi resigning from the party? I'm resigning with immediate effect. And this week, a leaked document suggested the party improperly spent EU funds on political campaigning in the UK. Another headache for whoever takes over the leadership of the PAC.
One contender is Suzanne Evans, a former Tory councillor who's fallen out with Nigel Farage and was briefly suspended for disloyalty. Also standing, Paul Nuttall, an MEP from Liverpool, who's been by Farage's side as his deputy for six years. There's another big beast in the UKIP leadership contest, and I'm told that today he can be spotted here on the Cumbrian coast. He's John Rees Evans, a businessman and adventurer who's offering members the chance to propose policies via a website called UKIP Direct. We've got really dedicated, you know, passionate supporters who feel like they're not really being listened to and they're not even being used very well. Typically what happens is they just basically sit there until six months before a general election when they're contacted and asked to go out and leaflet and canvas. And, you know, even at branch level, people feel that there are not adequate kind of, um, there's not an adequate flow of communication up and down the party. I want to rectify all of that. Are you not going to take part in any hustings? He left a hustings saying the contest was an establishment coronation and has made colourful comments in the past. He's in favour of the death penalty for crimes like paedophilia. I think there is a, um, a clear will amongst the British people that such heinous offences should be dealt with decisively. But again, on an issue like that, that is something I'd put to the members. Our members are not going to agree with me on everything and I don't believe that I would have any authority to have the say and determine the future direction of the party. I mean, what, what, what method would you use for the, for the death penalty? Again, that is something that could be determined by you know, suggestions that were made from within the party. Oh, so you'd have like an online poll about whether you used the, the electric chair or yeah, an for, lethal for, injection? For example, arguments would be made in favour of all of the various you know, methods. This is such a small aspect of what I'm standing for. Essentially, when, when in mainstream media, they try to trivialise a person's campaign by focusing on pretty irrelevant details. This is one, one vote that the membership would have. What I'm actually trying to do in this party is to revolutionise the democratic process in the UK. And that's really what your viewers should be concentrating on. It would be up to you. With to him at the helm, he reckons UKIP would win at least 30 seats at the next election. Meanwhile, in New York, on a visit to Trump Tower, Nigel Farage admired the plumage of the president-elect, a man he's described as a silver-backed gorilla, a friendship that's been condemned by some in this leadership contest. There are also elections to the party's National Executive Committee, a body that's been roundly criticised by roughly everyone. Welcome to Planet UKIP. There's a lot going on down there. And we're joined now by the two front runners in this UKIP leadership election, Suzanne Evans and Paul Nuttall. And we're going to kick off by giving each of them 30 seconds to lay out their case as to why they would be the best leader, starting with Suzanne Evans. UKIP's at its best when it's scaring the political establishment, forcing it to address those problems it would rather ignore. But to really change people's lives for the better and fast, we need to win seats in elections right across the country. To win at the ballot box, we need to attract more women, more ethnic minorities, and more of those Labour voters who no longer recognise their party. I know how to do that. UKIP under my leadership will be the same patriotic, common sense, radical party it's always been, just even more successful. Thank you, Suzanne Evans. Paul Nuttall. Uh, well, I'm standing on a platform of unity and experience. I believe that the party has to come together uh, if it is not only to survive but prosper. I believe I'm the best candidate to ensure that happens. I'm not part of any faction in the party. Uh, and beyond that, I've done every single job uh, within the party, whether that is uh, as head of policy, whether that's party chairman, whether that's deputy leader for Nigel for the past six years. I believe UKIP has great opportunities in Labour constituencies uh, where we can move in and become the patriotic voice of working people. And beyond that, we have to ensure that the government's feet is held to the fire on Brexit and we get All real right. Brexit, not a mealy mouth version. Oh, Nato, yeah. many people have said this party is ungovernable. How would you get a grip of it? Uh, well, I believe I'm the only candidate who can get a grip on it. Uh, firstly, people have to realise that the cause is bigger than any personality. We have to get together in a room and sort out not just spokespeople role, uh, but roles within uh, the organisation, party chairman, party secretary and whatnot. Uh, but as I say, 
UKIP has to unite. We're on 13% in the opinion polls. The future is bright. There's open goals, but UKIP has to be on the pitch to kick the ball he in. He says he's the only one that can get a grip of this party. Well, I disagree. I think, you know, I have a huge amount of experience in the party as well. And I've also got a background that I think means I can help bring people together. I've always said throughout this campaign that nothing breeds unity faster than success. And it's under my leadership that we will be successful. I think there's a lot of concern about the future of our National Executive Committee well, going forward. Mr Farage just called it the, quote, the lowest grade of people I've ever met. Do you agree with that? No, absolutely not. And I think, he, I think he must have been having a, having a bad day. I think what we need to do with our National Executive Committee is make it more accountable to the membership. It needs to be more open, more democratic, what uh, which is what, the, of course, what, what we want right across politics. Well, committee. I've been calling for the National Executive Committee to be elected regionally since 2010. That would give uh, the members better communication lines and make it far more transparent than it is would today. Would you have a clear out of the office holders? Uh, no, I wouldn't actually. I think the chairman of the party, Paul Ogden, he's the interim chairman at the yeah. moment, is doing a very good okay. job and he's the only person who's come out of this summer with his reputation enhanced. Let's uh, let me show you a picture that we've all seen of your current uh, leader, uh, Mr Farage, with President-elect Donald Trump. Uh, Paul Nato, you cri criticised Mr Farage's decision to appear at rallies during the American election. You yep. called Mr Trump appalling. Uh, yep. Do you stick by that? I wouldn't have voted for him. I made that perfectly clear. But do you uh, still think he's appalling now that he's president-elect? Well, hang on. I think some of the things he said were appalling during the campaign. But I think now he's president-elect, it's quite clear he'll be good for Britain, he'll be good for British trade, he's pro-Brexit, and he's an Anglophile. The first thing he's done is put the bust of Winston Churchill back in the Oval Office. Uh, you, uh, Suzanne Evans, called Mr Trump one of the weakest candidates the US has ever had. Yes, and I said the same thing about Hillary Clinton as well. Well, they um, both can be weakest. Well, well, obviously one of the one. I think the fact is a better candidate on either side would have beaten the other. I think that's quite clear. But do um, you stand by that or are you glad that your leader, Mr Farage, has actually got rather strong ties to him? I am. I mean, why wouldn't I be? You know, for us, for UKIP to have that connection, that direct connection, can only be good for our party. Weren't you out of step in the Mr Farage was in step? Because it looks like your voters, according to some polling I've seen, they rather like Mr Trump and his policies. Uh, look, you know, if I'm the leader... You didn't say he was appalling. Hang on, let, let, let me finish. If... I'm the leader of UKIP. I won't be involving myself in foreign elections. I'll be concentrating here in this country, ensuring we get UKIP people elected to council chambers and we win seats in 2020. Yeah, the other thing that your leader has in common with Mr Trump is that they, he rather admires President Vladimir Putin, do you? No, I don't. I think you look at you look at Putin's record. You know, I, I think he's invaded he's invaded Ukraine. He's invaded Georgia. We we had the case of Alexander Litvinenko when Russian agents were were so you're not a fan people. So I'm absolutely Kremlin. not what a fan. About you? No. Uh, I think that Putin is pretty much a nasty man. Uh, but beyond that, I believe that in, for example, the Middle East, uh, I think. He's, he's generally getting it right in many areas. I think what we need to do is to bring the conflict what, what, bombing, into... Well, bombing, hang on, hang bombing on. civilians no, no, in no, no, hang on. We need to bring the conflict in Syria to an end as fast as possible. And, uh, and uh, the British line and the American line before Trump has been let arm these rebels. I mean, these rebels include the Al-Nusra Front, which is affiliated to Al-Qaeda, the Syrian Mujahideen, which is linked to the Taliban. Okay. I mean, we need to clear these people out and ensure that Syria becomes a stable state. Let's have another look at this, this controversial poster. You UKIP's breaking point poster during the election campaign. Mr Farage uh, unveiled it. There he is standing in front of it. You condemned it. Do you still? Yes, I think it was uh, the wrong poster at the wrong time. I was involved with Vote Leave's campaign as well as uh, UKIP's campaign and I felt very strongly that the people who were concerned about immigration were already going to vote for Leave because it was an absolute fundamental uh, truth that unless we left the European Union we, we <coughs> couldn't control immigration. So I felt it was about approaching those softer voters, those waverers, those ones who weren't quite sure with some of the other arguments to leave the European you said it Union. Was Sovereignty. So I don't think I said it was racist. Uh, but, but sovereignty and about trade and so on and so forth. And that's where we needed to go. And, and I was concerned that it might once again put right. off some of those wavering What was your attitude to that voters. poster? I mean, pe people may well say, look, it was part of the winning uh, campaign. It was kind of UKIP shock and awe. That's what you stand for. That makes you different. Look, I've been pretty open within the party and I've said I wouldn't have gone for that poster at that moment in time. I thought it was clumsy and I thought it was wrong to do so uh, just a week out before the referendum. However, I do believe that it raised legitimate concerns with a deluge of people of biblical proportions making their way from the Middle East and North Africa onto the continent of Europe. Now, both of you obviously think UKIP should 
compete for all the votes it can get from anywhere. But where's the low-hanging fruit for you, particularly in England? Is it Labour? Voters or Conservative voters? Well, I obviously want to hang on to those Conservative voters we've already got, but I think it's actually the low-hanging fruit is Labour. You look at the Labour Party today, you've got Jeremy Corbyn won't sing the national anthem. Emily Thornbury despises the English flag. You know, Diane Abbott thinks anyone talking about immigration is racist, not to mention John McDonald and his feelings about the IRA. I think, as I said in my opening, mm. Labour has ceased to be a party for working people. Okay. I think UKIP is absolutely going to be that party. Yeah, it's, it's clear. I, I absolutely concur with everything Suzanne has said. And I, I, I first uh, voiced this back in 2008 in UKIP that I believe that UKIP has a fantastic opportunity in working class communities and everyone laughed at me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's clear now that we resonate with working people and you've seen that in the Brexit results right across the country. Yeah. Would you bring back the death penalty? It, it wouldn't be UKIP policy. Absolutely not. If the NH NHS asks for more money, would you give it and how would you finance it? I think it's very important that the NHS is funded adequately. It hasn't been, I don't think, to date. Uh, we promised in our manifesto that we would give £12 billion a year extra to the NHS over the course of this Parliament. And had we been in a position to do, to do so, we'd have stuck to that. So where but for me you, also, it's where, about, where does the money come from? Well, it's also about tackling health tourism. I think the NHS yeah. is being taken for a ride at the moment. It's but about that making may, sure that, that won't people have That may be identities. right to wrong. Where, where does the money come from? You you're not going to get it from that alone. It's, it's also about scaling back management okay. in the NHS because that, again, has burgeoned beyond control. We are, they were spending far more money on management Where than Where would you we get the money be. from? Well, we, we need to look at things like HS2. Exactly. We need to look at yeah. things like foreign aid. Mm -hmm. uh, now we've got Brexit and we'll be saving on the membership fee. Suzanne's absolutely right in cutting back on management. It cannot be right, Andrew, that 51% yeah, of people who work in England for the NHS are not clinically but qualified. But you don't save on the membership fee till we've left and that's not going to be till 2019 20 the nhs needs money now where are you going to get it from well you can save off hs2 immediately it's going to cost but upwards of 80 billion spending and it's spread over a long period where are you going to get the money okay, to well, pay I'll, now I'll, I'll give you another one we're spending 25 million pounds every single day on foreign aid giving foreign aid to countries in some cases who are richer than ourselves barnet formula as well that absolutely, formula, absolutely needs another look you're going to take money away from scotland yeah i think they get too much at the moment all right uh let's just get your personal taste salad cream or mayonnaise uh, mayonnaise, but with some garlic in it, preferably too. Mayonnaise. Continental. <laughs> I'm a salad cream person myself. <laughs> PG tips or Earl Grey? Earl Grey. PG tips. PG tips. Strictly Come Dancing or X Factor? Um, do you know what? I don't actually watch either. I, I'm a kind of like thriller girl. Strictly. Strictly. <laughs> you just like it. I'd love, to, I'd love to be on it one day. <laughs> there you go.